Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Guillermo Esparza to uh, the stage for his PhD defense today. So Guillermo was born in Mexico City and came here in his middle childhood, <laughs> um, grew up in Arizona and earned admission as a physics major to Harvey Mudd College. And there, Guillermo explored skateboarding and other interests uh, and maybe didn't quite have academics at the forefront of his mind and spent some time as a, uh, as a, a journeyman, um, as a, uh, an R&D scientist in a material startup, but also spent a lot of time doing some, uh, some extracurricular reading in uh, chemistry, material science, physics, and then a few years back in 2017-18, he did some uh, extension studies, and that's where we met for the first time in Professor Fenning's course on uh, a graduate seminar on solar cell technologies. And then when Guillermo enrolled officially in the MS and later PhD program, we met again in Nano 202, uh, intermolecular and surface forces, which Guillermo took as an elective for some reason, and uh, we met uh, we met there. Um, Guillermo always sat in the first row and asked really good questions. Always kept me on my toes um, as an instructor. And toward the end of the quarter, when we were um, doing. Um, I don't remember if it was a final project that year, but there was a uh, one time late at night, I got an email from Guillermo that was a link to a David Attenborough video on the Brazilian pygmy gecko, which very well uh, exemplifies hydro super hydrophobicity, the ability for uh, small animals to walk on water based on uh, based on nanostructures in their toe pads. And um, later that year, not knowing, um, that's the official story, not knowing if Guillermo had, a, uh, had an advisor um, or whether he had transitioned from the MS to the PhD program, I reached out and said, hey, we have this open position for a grad student for, on a PV project that, uh, uh, that, that was a, a co, potentially a co project between David Fenning's lab and mine. And so the rest is history. Over the next four years, uh, Guillermo has been a highly valuable member of the lab, uh, really being an intellectual anchor uh, in the lab and, and um, really providing uh, some continuity and a, a steady hand at the wheel that, uh, that a student who has had a little more life experience, is a little bit older, can, uh, can provide and also doesn't tolerate hand wavy explanations of anything, especially coming from me, <laughs> which, uh, which is great. And uh, Guillermo is a highly curious person and some, someone that I'm proud to say will be joining us after, uh, after today for the next couple of years for another joint project in a different, a bit of a different uh, area, also uh, as a joint project between um, David Fenning and myself. And in terms of honors and awards, Guillermo has published in excellent journals, including uh, first author paper in advanced materials and is co-author on many of his lab mates, voice to text said flatmates publications, but <laughs> okay. Uh, and this past year was funded by the inaugural dissertation year fellowship from the material science department. So we're really looking forward to hearing about your great research from the last, uh, the last four of, uh, years in the group, five, maybe five years total. Um, and so let's welcome Guillermo to the stage. Well, uh, thank you very much, Darren. I, uh, I really appreciate that introduction and, uh, yeah, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Joining your lab four years ago was uh, the best professional decision that I have ever made. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, thank you to all of you for being here for my dissertation today. Um, I am going to be talking about uh, my dissertation work, um, which is uh, face, uh, it's focused on solid phase processing techniques uh, of optoelectronic materials 
for photovoltaic applications. The image shown here uh, is a solid film of P27TH, which is a conjugated polymer we'll be learning about. Uh, and uh, we're going to be, yeah, just seeing all of the different ways, well, not all, some of the different ways that uh, you can access new processing routes by working in the solid phase uh, versus conventional processing techniques. So um, our outline is going to be uh, some general background. Uh, we're going to build a solar cell starting from atoms and understand what processes uh, are, are at play there. Uh, and then uh, we're going to jump into each of the three major projects that I have focused on over the last four years. So with that said, um, we're going to start like uh, any good physicist would uh, by discussing the particle in a box. Now, if you're not familiar with the particle in a box, it's basically a toy model that physicists like to use. Uh, as a, It's a toy model of an atom that physicists like to use to develop their intuition about quantum mechanical systems. And uh, there's lots that can be said about this system, but in particular, uh, I want to uh, highlight two key things. One is that when you're at these scales, a particle trapped within the box is going to be able to occupy only discrete energy levels and make transitions at those discrete levels. So that would be n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, et cetera, all the way to infinity. Um, and when we grow the size of the box, uh, those energy levels are going to come down. They're going to collapse. And so if you have an electron, say, at the ground state, n equals 1, uh, it is an energetically favorable development for the box to grow in size. Um, so moving right along, the first actual atom, uh, the simplest atom would be hydrogen. And these are cross-sections of what the different orbitals of hydrogen look like uh, when it's excited to different states. And we're not going to uh, spend too much time on, on the shape of them, but I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, actual atoms make these discrete transitions, uh, both energetically, and then they also wind up changing their shape and size when they do so. Um, so focusing on the discrete transitions in particular, um, uh, there's any number of different ways by which an electron can take in energy or, or uh, get rid of it, shed it, but uh, of particular interest to us are optical transitions where uh, a photon is involved. And absorption and emission of a photon are basically uh, exactly the same process, just reversed in time. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why the hydrogen spectrum uh, emission and absorption are basically uh, complete inverses of each other perfectly. Um, and so you know, here's another view of, of the hydrogen spectrum. And just to give a little hint as to uh, the, how things grow in complexity, this is helium. And you can see that those transitions are much more complex. If you just add a proton and an electron to your system, uh, well, and also uh, two neutrons, but uh, they don't play such a big role, uh, things get much more complex. Um, and so uh, you know, th this is a spectrum for atomic hydrogen. Um, but what happens when we bring two hydrogen atoms together. Um, well, uh, each orbital can accommodate two electrons, and uh, we get a process known as orbital mixing, uh, where you get two new orbitals when you bring them close enough to each other, uh, that uh, where one will be lower than the, than the two orbitals that you're mixing, and the other one will be higher. And uh, in this case, it's an energetically favorable interaction. You form a bond. Diatomic hydrogen is how you generally find hydrogen in nature. And that's because the two electrons that were in the 1s orbitals can now transition to the sigma 1s uh, 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 mixed orbital and uh, lower the energy. Again, uh, thinking back to the particle in a box, you're growing the size of the box, and so it is an energetically favorable transition. Um, However, this doesn't always happen. Uh, if we consider the case of helium, uh, then uh, we already have two electrons per orbital, uh, per atomic orbital. And uh, when, uh, when you bring them close together, you would have mixing, uh, except that two of the electrons lower the energy, but two of them actually raise it, and you don't really get a net benefit. And so this doesn't happen in nature. Uh, helium is a noble gas, and uh, there's no diatomic helium. Um, and so now, as we keep adding more and more atoms, uh, you get more and more orbital mixing up until the point where you get macroscopic clumps of atoms, things that you can actually see. Uh, and so that was a silicon crystal. Uh, and uh, now, instead of having these sort of discrete transitions, once you've mixed enough orbitals, the gap between 
those energy levels becomes effectively zero, and you get what is called the density of states. Uh, now, all materials have a density of states, uh, and, uh, but there's some, some key features here. So in the black, uh, that's the density of states, and uh, there's uh, what's called the band gap here. Uh, now, the band gap uh, is of critical importance in uh, material science. It's what distinguishes uh, a, a metal from a semiconductor and insulator. Semiconductors and insulators have a band gap. Metals do not. Um, and so uh, the energy at absolute zero, uh, the energy levels uh, below the band gap are going to be fully populated, and all of the energy levels above the band gap are going to be completely empty. That's the valence bands and the conduction bands, respectively. Uh, and as soon as we turn on the temperature, uh, electrons start m gaining enough energy to hop across that transition, and you start getting some empty states in the valence band called holes, and you start getting uh, conduction band electrons across the band gap. Uh, however, uh, you can also uh, give the electrons enough energy to make that transition uh, optically, uh, as with the hydrogen atom. And uh, so if we look at the absorption coefficient of silicon in red on the right there, uh, that uh, the point at which it crosses the, the x-axis there uh, is uh, essentially the, the same energy associated with the, the band gap transition, 1.1 electron volts. Um, and so now we're ready to actually build a solar cell. Now, if you didn't know, a solar cell is basically just a very fancy sandwich, okay? You're taking a bunch of materials and you're carefully stacking them together uh, in order to get uh, an appropriate energetic landscape within your material. Uh, and so that's the band gap right there. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when you set up your materials correctly, you can bring in a photon and excite the electron across your gap, again, leaving a hole. Uh, now, the hole behaves essentially like a positive charge, and the electrons will flow down rolling down like marbles in the energy landscape, and holes will float up like bubbles. And so by setting up this energy landscape, uh, we're able to separate the positive and the negative charge to opposite sides, and uh, then extract current to our external circuit and run our lights or whatever. Um, now, when you have a solar cell, the uh, quickest and most direct way of, of seeing how your solar cell is performing, or at least the uh, most common way, is to take what is called a JV curve, uh, where you essentially subject your solar cell to different voltages. Uh, and as you're subjecting it to different voltages, you're going to be able to get different currents uh, for a given uh, uh, sort of illumination. And uh, you get a curve that looks like this if you have a very nice solar cell. Um, now, if we take that JV curve, and multiply it by the voltage again, we get the power, uh, the power density. Uh, and uh, from the power density, we're able to very quickly extract what the maximum power is, so the optimal voltage at which we should be operating our solar cell. Um, and so then, uh, going back up to the top diagram, the X and Y intercepts are the uh, open circuit voltage and short circuit current, uh, respectively, uh, highlighted in, in the green there. Uh, and they're basically measures of the, the maximum uh, voltage and current that your solar cell can ever really produce when it's in the power uh, producing quadrant uh, of, of your JV curve. And um, then uh, if we look at the maximum power point, we can now draw two rectangles that look like this. Uh, and uh, the ratio and area of those two rectangles is called the fill factor. You want the fill factor to be as close to one as possible. And that one is basically a measure of how healthy your solar cell is. If the JV curve is all squashed in and not particularly square, then that means that your solar cell uh, has some sort of uh, serious issue. Um, now, uh, for solar cells, particularly uh, single junction solar cells, meaning there's just one uh, of these energetic humps to sort charge at. Uh, there, there are uh, well-established theoretical limits in efficiency, uh, and uh, that's shown in this curve here, particularly the, the blue one. And uh, as you can see, the, the silicon band gap at 1.1 is pretty close to the optimal band gap uh, for this theoretical limit. Now, uh, the, the theoretical limit of efficiency for a silicon cell is about 33%. And the record silicon cell today is 26.8%. Uh, and so these devices are pretty darn close to perfect. 
Uh, there's not too much room for improvement, and this serves as a key motivation for exploring other solar technologies. Uh, now, this chart here uh, is uh, put out by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and it tracks uh, all of the record efficiencies for various solar cell technologies. Uh, however, we're going to clean it up, and I just want to highlight uh, three slash four in particular. In the blue there, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the core single junction silicon cell technologies, which, as you can see, have kind of stagnated over the years. Uh, and then uh, in, the, in the yellow circle, uh, we have, um, let's see, yeah, right here, uh, we have single junction perovskite cells. And then up, up above it, we have what are called tandem cells uh, between silicon and perovskites. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, what that means for a, a cell to be a tandem cell. Um, but, you know, I just want to show you this chart so that we know uh, the, the three key technologies that we kind of care about here. And so talking about these emerging photovoltaic technologies, perovskite uh, cells uh, are characterized by the inclusion of a perovskite material, which itself is characterized by an ABX3 crystal structure as shown here. Uh, and in the case of a typical perovskite cell, you need at minimum three materials. Um, you need your perovskite absorber, and then you need uh, what's called a hole transport layer and an electron transport layer. And the purpose of these materials is just to provide that energetic landscape. Again, we're sorting charge, uh, electrons to one side, holes to the other, and uh, in the, those, those two sandwiching materials uh, provide uh, that, that sorting. And then, of course, you need the, the uh, external electrodes. Um, and the efficiency record for these devices is 26.0%, so really close to, to the record silicon devices after uh, comparatively much shorter development time. Um, however, they suffer from low environmental stability against stressors, uh, and uh, I think it's safe to say that the, uh, improving the stability of these devices is one of the central focus points in the field of perovskite photovoltaics. Um, now, uh, talking about perovskite and silicon tandems. Uh, so a tandem device is basically a device that just stacks multiple solar cells together. Uh, and you pick your solar cells so that they absorb different parts of the spectrum and therefore uh, utilize it more efficiently. If we look at these JV and power curves, in the blue we have a silicon cell, in the orange we have a, a perovskite device, and then in the green we have a tandem. And as you can see from the JV curves, the uh, current from the tandem is fundamentally limited by the current that can be produced by the lower current device. Um, but the, uh, the, the voltage that you can get out is essentially doubled, uh, per particularly if you're connecting them in series as what is known as a two-terminal tandem. Um, and then if we look at the power curves, uh, there, there is a very significant boost in the power generated by the tandem device as compared to the silicon and perovskite devices um, uh, individually. And so the efficiency record for these devices is 33.7%, at least as of two days ago. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this brings us to, uh, you know, I didn't check this morning, so. Um, <laughs> this brings us to uh, uh, the material that is most important uh, to, for the purposes of, of this defense, uh, which would be conjugated polymers. Now, uh, conjugated polymers uh, play a significant role in these uh, emerging PV technologies, and uh, they're, they're particularly used generally as charge extraction layers. Um, they play other roles in other technologies, but for perovskite and, and uh, perovskite silicon tandems, that's, that's what they're used for typically. And um, uh, these these uh, polymers are characterized by uh, these hybridized p orbitals, where you know again you have uh, orbital mixing, and uh, you wind up uh, with orbitals that don't just span say two hydrogen atoms, but actually span a very significant length of the polymer backbone. And it's de these delocalized uh, orbitals uh, combined with a band gap, etc. Uh, that lead to the particularly interesting electronic and optical properties of these materials. Um, and these materials typically suffer from complex synthesis, low solubility, uh, and then uh, unfavorable mechanical properties. Uh, typically, when you, um, when you increase the solubility or improve their mechanical properties, this comes at the expense of the electronic and optical properties. And one of the central uh, focuses of our group has been uh, in, uh, in getting sort of the best of both worlds without having to, to compromise too much on, on either. Um, 
Now, um, this takes us to uh, conventional processing of semiconductors with a special focus on these conjugated polymers. Uh, so typical uh, processing techniques fall under two uh, categories. One would be vapor phase processing, where you have vapor of some material that then deposits on your surface, and this includes uh, methods such as uh, evaporation techniques, sputtering, chemical vapor deposition, atomic layer deposition, molecular uh, layer deposition, etc. Um, and these, these uh, techniques are very powerful. You can get very nice and uniform layers, uh, including in, in highly complex topography, depending on the technique that you use. Um, but you're limited by low molecular diversity, and this is due to the fact that, uh, particularly for polymers, you're polymerizing in situ, uh, which means that uh, you know, perhaps your monomers require heterogeneous synthesis uh, you know, at an interface between uh, liquid and a solid, so you can't necessarily produce those monomers from the vapor phase. And additionally, the bigger your monomer, the lower your vapor pressure, and so uh, you can get to a point where you, you just uh, straight up can't deposit uh, some, many materials by these vapor phase techniques. And then uh, on the other side, we have solution phase processing. So uh, this would include things like spin coating, slot die coating, blade spray coating, et cetera. Uh, and uh, these techniques, uh, are limited by solvent orthogonality, which is this concept where uh, if you're depositing something from solution, you need to make sure that whatever solvent you chose isn't dissolving the underlying layers, and this can place very significant restrictions on your processing. Uh, and then typically, in order to get a uniform coating, it also demands substrate planarity, which, as we will see, is kind of a problem for photovoltaics. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be convinced that uh, solid phase processing opens up entirely new possibilities that can help address some of these pitfalls uh, from more conventional uh, processing techniques. Um, and so the last slide of the background, um, I want to talk about uh, this technique known as interfacial spreading, which is the one that I have, I didn't develop it, but uh, I have used it extensively throughout my PhD in order to form these pre-solidified films. Uh, now, the way that it works is you, uh, you make a solution of, of polymer, and with appropriate uh, solvent selection, uh, by placing the droplet of polymer on the surface of water, uh, you can get spontaneous spreading of that solution across the surface. And this occurs due to a reduction in the interfacial free energy of the system. Uh, water has a very high surface tension. It's not an energetically favorable surface to exist. Uh, and so nature tries to cover it up by some means. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we, use, uh, if we use the appropriate type of solvent, uh, it'll spread quite uniformly. And then once it does, your solvent can evaporate and leave behind this thin, uh, uniform film across the surface of water. Uh, and then uh, once, once you've done that, uh, you can manipulate it in a number of ways. Uh, the process is... Uh, quite tunable. Uh, the thickness can range from about 15 to 20 nanometers to hundreds of nanometers, and the film can form in a matter of seconds. Um, and so this brings us to the first project, solid phase deposition. And uh, we need to talk a little bit about uh, light management in photovoltaics, particularly uh, in, in silicon solar cells. Now, uh, light management is a variety of different techniques by which the uh, uh, the optical path length of light is enhanced so that you can uh, increase the length of travel of light and increase your absorption without necessarily using more material. In silicon solar cells, the, uh, for single crystals uh, in particular, the most common technique is the formation of pyramids on the surface. And uh, just to, to illustrate the benefits of uh, this sort of texturing, if you just have a planar cell, then you get mostly one pass through of light and any light that bounces uh, out at that first incidence is just gone forever. It goes into space. Now, if you have a highly reflective surface, you can enhance, again, that optical path length uh, on the backside. Um, but if you start in incorporating texture, you actually have the light entering at oblique angles uh, within your device. And so without increasing the thickness of your cell, you are now uh, increasing the distance that it travels, and if you have texturing on both sides, well, then you have all sorts of incidence events. Um, but yeah, so th this is a very important uh, technique in silicon solar cells, um, and uh, unfortunately, it, it creates all sorts of, uh, of processing hangups. 
Um, but as you can see from, from this chart, by increasing the, the size of our pyramids, therefore making it harder to process, um, you, you pretty dramatically uh, decrease the reflectivity. Um, and so we won't get into all of these different papers, uh, but they're just examples in the literature of uh, various attempts at dealing with uh, this texturing. In some cases, uh, just spin coating was used, uh, like down here, and then there's uh, uniformity issues. In other cases, uh, you wind up just depositing really thick films. Uh, in other cases, we evaporate small molecules uh, as the transport layers. And yet, in other cases, we have uh, just, we process a planar device and uh, the, the texturing is so important that we just apply a textured foil at the end of it all to try and incorporate it. Um, and then in here, they used solution processing uh, and then uh, blew out excess solution with nitrogen in order to try and get a, a conformal coating. And th that, that worked actually quite well. Um, but our approach uh, was to process from the solid phase. And so we have our floating polymer film and our substrate, which we have treated in air plasma in order to render it highly hydro hydrophilic. Uh, it has a very high surface energy. We contact it down onto the surface of the polymer film. Um, and uh, at, at this stage, a little bit of water uh, winds up ingressing into the gap between the polymer film and your substrate. And we'll talk about the role of that water, but it's very important. Um, and then we wipe away uh, excess polymer and then gently skim it from the surface. Uh, and then if things have been set up correctly, uh, this, uh, this uh, polymer coating will just uh, form spontaneously. The, the polymer will plastically deform and conform to the textured surface. Um, and so here's a, a little bit of microscopy uh, showing that happening. On the right, we have a video uh, where you will see the, what just happened? Okay. Uh, where you will see the, um, uh, the polymer film coating. The dots that you see there are the pyramid uh, peaks kind of point, uh, poking out, uh, not poking through, but poking out. Um, and then on the left here, um, we have a scanning electron micrograph where uh, on the top left, we have a slightly lighter region. And on the bottom right, we have slightly darker region. The contrast here is due entirely uh, to the presence of polymer on the bottom right, uh, which you can see the coating is highly, highly conformal. Uh, and then that feature that is crossing diagonally uh, through the image is a portion of rolled up film uh, that you can actually see descending down onto the surface right there. Um, and so uh, moving along, um, you know, that, those, those SEMs and video are, are paint, a, paint a nice picture, but, uh, you know, issues can occur, in particular uh, this defect that you see occurring in this video, which we termed snapback. Uh, and uh, the way that it happens is as follows. Um, so, like I mentioned, there's, uh, the substrate needs to be rendered hydrophilic, and water fills that gap. Uh, and the presence of water is important because it's adhering to both the uh, substrate surface and to the polymer film. And as water molecules diffuse through the polymer film, that volume of water decreases, and it essentially pulls down on the polymer, sort of sucking it down onto the, the substrate surface. Um, however, uh, if, uh, if too much strain energy accumulates in the polymer film, uh, then a headspace uh, between the water and the polymer will spontaneously form, uh, and that manifests as snapback, which is the, the defect that you saw happening there. Um, and so we wanted to understand uh, how this happens and, and what role the material selection might, uh, might be playing. And so uh, we went ahead and, and looked at, uh, we needed to tune the amount of strain energy that was being accumulated in our film. And so we used the P3ATs, uh, the polythiophenes, uh, which by varying the alkyl side chain length, uh, you're able to uh, monotonically vary a lot of those mechanical properties. And then we also looked at the, at the effect of varying the thickness, since this would be another way to, uh, to tune the total amount of strain energy being stored in the films. Um, and basically what we found is that the stiffer or thicker that the polymer is, uh, then the, the greater the occurrence of, of, of snapback. And we, we did this analysis basically by just taking a bunch of top-down SEMs and using image analysis to see how much of our film was fully coating and how much was snapping back, right? Um, and so, you know, this might, uh, this might uh, 
seem like it dooms this process to be very limited in applicability. Um, but it turns out that you can assist the, the process in a wide variety of ways. Those, th those uh, experiments were being performed in air at ambient conditions. Um, and uh, this would be an example of, of such a film where snapback happened. But if you expose the, the freshly transferred uh, polymer plus substrate to, uh, to solvent vapor, in our particular case, we used chloroform. Um, we, we found that it completely dealt with, uh, with the snapback. And uh, this is a cross-sectional SEM of, uh, you know, the exact same uh, conditions, same substrate, same, same polymer, same film thickness. Um, but as you can see, it, it forms a, a quite uniform coating. Uh, in the valleys, they are basically perfectly filled. On the peaks, uh, there is some slight thinning that happens, uh, probably due to a, a concentration of stress there, um, but uh, regardless, there, there's no apparent puncturing of the film, and it's worth noting that these pyramids uh, I prepared myself, and they are much sharper than would be seen on a typical solar cell. Uh, it turns out I'm not that good at making pyramids, but um, there's, uh, there's additional, um, uh, additional ways to assist this method, uh, so one would be the inclusion of co-solvents. Uh, we wanted to... Uh, to try using this, this polymer, DPP-DTT, which is an exceptionally brittle conjugated polymer. And uh, DIO uh, is, uh, is a common small molecule additive in a, a lot of um, uh, uh, organic photovoltaic uh, approaches, or technologies, excuse me. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, with 0% DIO inclusion, uh, there's these massive cracks that form at the pyramid peaks, right? There's, there's no semblance of a good coating there. Uh, and then by s adding a small amount of uh, DIO to our solution, we can significantly improve it. And then at 3%, uh, we're, we're basically back up to, to a essentially perfect coating. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, it turns out that by elevating the temperature, you, you can also have an effect. Um, in, it, it's particularly good at accelerating the process. So uh, performing a coating with P3HPT at ambient uh, conditions and, and just in air, uh, uh, the coating uh, here for a film thickness of about 30 nanometers, if I recall correctly, uh, was taking uh, right around two minutes, um, a little bit less, maybe a minute and a half. Uh, but then by uh, exposing it to pretty mild temperatures, it went down to just a, a couple of seconds. Uh, so it, it can be greatly accelerated, and presumably this happens both because it accelerates the evaporation, at, well, the diffusion and evaporation of water through the film, um, but also uh, it facilitates the plastic deformation uh, of, the, of the conjugated polymer. Um, and so, um, yeah, that brings us to our next project, um, which uh, we coined solvent-free transfer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mentioned solvent orthogonality earlier, uh, and it, it turns out solid phase processing has been explored uh, to some extent as a, ways to, as a means to circumvent uh, this solvent orthogonality restriction. And basically, uh, you would take two materials that would normally be dissolved in the same types of solvents, uh, and so you couldn't conventionally deposit these sequentially, uh, but instead by just uh, coating once and then stamping the second one, uh, you don't expose it to any, to any of those solvents. However, uh, such approaches still expose the device stack to water, and, well, water is quite a good solvent in and of itself, uh, and, uh, and not just a solvent, but it's also reactive, and so lots of ma uh, materials of interest uh, that are water-sensitive would include things like perovskites, alkali metals for batteries, many different types of oxides, salts, et cetera. Um, and so if we can uh, remove the presence of water by some means, uh, we can expand the, the applicability. Uh, and the, the, film themselves, the films themselves can potentially be used in other ways. Um, and so in this process, uh, solvent-free transfer, uh, we start with the formation of the uh, film by interfacial spreading, seen there. So that's the spreading of the polymer solution. And then the solvent evaporates, leaving behind our polymer film. And then we contact the film down with uh, this drum that just touches the film at the edges. Uh, it adheres via van der Waals forces. Uh, and then you're able to quite smoothly uh, shear off the film 
from the surface of the water. And so, uh, you know, that film is, is 15 nanometers. And then you, uh, you've designed your drum and a substrate carriage so that they uh, mate via gears, uh, sort of a rack and pinion type of con configuration. And, um, uh, yeah, you, you roll your carriage underneath, and then the film can just be cleanly transferred onto your substrate surface. Um, now, uh, you know, that's, again, painting quite a, quite a nice picture, but we wanted to understand what were some of the process limitations, so we explored a variety of different materials. Uh, you know, P380s are, once again, sort of our, our model material, um, but then we also looked at PolyTPD, which is a very common, high-performing HTL material in perovskites, and then uh, PTV7 and uh, DPP-DTT uh, have uh, high air stability and uh, exceptionally ho high hole mobilities, uh, respectively. Um, and uh, in particular, I want to draw your attention to PTV7TH. Uh, we had two batches at our disposal, which uh, had significantly different molecular weights. Uh, and uh, consequently, they also had uh, quite dramatically different uh, me mechanical properties. Uh, these are stress-strain curves uh, that were... Uh, prepared and collected by Alex Chen, Jordan Bunch, and Jaden Cramlett. Um, and, uh, you know, they did a, uh, a lot of good work for this figure. And uh, what we found was that uh, the higher molecular weight polymer uh, at 1.8 megajoules per meter squared in toughness uh, was very easily drawn at basically all of the thicknesses that we tried, uh, down to about 20 nanometers. Um, however, the lower molecular weight, which was significantly less tough, um, 0.3 megajoules per meter squared uh, could only be drawn when the film was made uh, sufficiently thick, around 35 nanometers. And this happens because essentially, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to shear the film, but you're still kind of peeling it away from the water a little bit. It, it is subjected to stresses. And uh, the thicker film is going to dilute those stresses more effectively. And so, uh, you know, we were able to draw these freestanding films, but with some caveats. And then DPP DCT, again, exceptionally brittle, uh, very low toughness of uh, 0.15 megajoules per meter squared. Um, no films were ever successfully drawn uh, with that polymer at all. Um, and so, uh, you know, with this knowledge in hand, we could, uh, we could take an approach and try and figure out how big of a film we could draw. And we didn't actually find the limit, um, but the largest film that we tried to draw were these uh, 10 by 10 centimeter uh, frames, and uh, you can see the, the frame is contacting it down there, and then you can just shear that off. Uh, this film is 20 nanometers thick uh, and uh, 100 square centimeters in area, so, uh, you know, an aspect ratio of edge to thickness of 1 to 5 million. Uh, for a little context, that's akin to taking the top meter of soil across the entire state of Texas. Um, so, and then once you have this film, you can just contact it down, and if you... Uh, your substrate and polymer have favorable interactions. That coating will happen uh, very spontaneously. If you blinked, you missed it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, there, there can be the occurrence of some bubbles in certain cases, but these can be eliminated by exposure to uh, solvent vapor. And in many cases, they actually just kind of resolve themselves. Again, these films are so thin, it's not exactly a, you know, a plastic chip bag. The it, gases can diffuse right through in a lot of cases. Um, and so, yeah, uh, they, these are just some images of the freestanding films and the transferred film onto our, onto our glass substrate. And uh, we did some profilometry uh, across uh, these films for two different polymers to uh, try and assess the uniformity. And, um, you know, the, the, the grids might seem to indicate that they're not very uniform, but, you know, they we're still seeing a variance of only five nanometers over this entire uh, area. Uh, you know, the, the films are just that thin. Um, and so uh, now w once we developed this, uh, this additional uh, expansion on the process, uh, we wanted to assess the quality of the films more, uh, more quantitatively. And so we did some uh, atomic force microscopy in order to look at the surface roughness and compare it against some spin-coated controls. We found that uh, the, the solvent-free transfer films were slightly smoother and this uh, smoothness could be further enhanced by exposing our films to, to chloroform vapor, again, uh, one of our main tricks. Um, and then uh, we wanted to verify that uh, the valleys in that AFM were not pinholes or anything like that, and so we just did some SEM to, to verify that. Uh, and then lastly, um, with the help of uh, 
uh, Moses Kodur uh, of the Fenning Group and uh, another Lipomi alum, uh, Rory Runzer. Uh, we did some uh, chronoamperometry in order to assess the, uh, the pinhole density. And essentially, the higher the current at the y-intercept, the, the higher the, the number of pinholes that we can expect. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the, the spin-coated films uh, had slightly uh, higher current than either uh, the small or large area solvent-free transferred films. Uh, and something that's pretty neat uh, is the fact that uh, there was essentially no loss in, in uh, uh, well, no, no uh, loss in quality uh, between the small and large area, which is very unusual. Typically, when you're scaling up a process in area, uh, something is going to go wrong and things are going to be worse. Um, but if anything, actually, for this batch of samples, the, the large area films uh, slightly outperformed the small area ones. Um, and this takes us to uh, our final slide in this project. Uh, we wanted to incorporate these films into some devices to actually look at how they might perform. And again, compare them against spin-coated controls. Uh, uh, with the help of Moses, uh, Alex Chen, Dr. Alex Chen, <laughs> and, um, and uh, our, our undergrad, Ben Wang. Uh, we, um, uh, we, we prepared some, some perovskite devices uh, where the, we used uh, solvent-free transfer P3HPT films as the whole transport layer. Um, and uh, here are the JV curves for those devices compared against the spin-coated controls. And as you can see, there are minimal differences. Um, they, they performed basically identically. Um, there's some slight deviations in the uh, open circuit voltage and short circuit current. Um, however, these, these films were prepared uh, from the exact same solution, same polymer, everything. Uh, and so the only way that we can, uh, that at least we've thought, to really uh, try to rationalize those slight differences in performance is just through differences in morphology uh, as... Uh, prior work from our group has shown uh, different processing techniques will uh, impact the morphology of, uh, of, of these films, particularly uh, solvent-free transferred or really interfacially spread films have significantly higher uh, edge-on orientations of the polymer films. Um, and uh, charge extraction from a solar cell is highly dependent on the energetics at interfaces. Uh, and so slightly different molecular orientations will influence slightly the energetics, well, potentially greatly, but will, will influence the energetics, and therefore you can expect to see slight differences in the electronic performance of your devices. Um, but regardless, it's not a significant difference, but we retain the benefit of uh, being able to uh, uh, create these coatings without exposing our substrates to solvents. Um, and this brings us to our last project, uh, which is transparent conductive oxide transfer. Uh, and uh, in, we need to talk a little bit about transparency versus conductivity. Now, uh, optoelectronic devices, such as solar cells, LEDs, touchscreens, uh, et cetera, uh, re often require at least one transparent but conductive electrode. Uh, unfortunately, these two material properties are fundamentally opposed to each other. Uh, and you might ask why. Well, we can think about uh, uh, these two uh, material parameters known as the plasma frequency and conductivity. Now, the plasma frequency is essentially a measure of uh, how effectively the electrons in your material can respond to an incoming oscillating electric field like that found in light. Uh, so that would be omega p. And for high transparency, we want a low plasma frequency uh, because... Uh, beyond the, for frequencies higher than the plasma frequency is um, where, uh, where the, the electrons are going to become more sluggish and therefore can't uh, uh, respond to that electric field and therefore reflect light. Uh, now, conductivity, on the other hand, well, we want a high conductivity, obviously. Um, and so uh, on the, the, the key thing that I want to highlight is that uh, the plasma frequency is proportional to the square root of the carrier density, and the conductivity is proportional to the carrier density. And so basically, as we increase the carrier density in our material, we are going to be making it less transparent but more conductive. And so there's this trade-off that we fundamentally have to balance out. Um, and so, uh, you know, an easy example to think about would just be like metals and glass. Metals, very conductive, not transparent. Glass, 
very transparent, not conductive. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this brings us to transparent conductive oxides. Uh, these materials are quite special. Uh, an example of, of such a material would be indium tin oxide, which is a semiconductor, a degenerate semiconductor, but a semiconductor nonetheless. And it has a band gap of about four electron volts, uh, which is uh, slightly into the UV. And then the uh, photon energy corresponding to the plasma frequency is right around one electron volt, slightly into the IR. And so it has this transparency window uh, that very neatly nests uh, the visible spectrum. Um, and so uh, you know, it makes it exceptionally useful for all sorts of optoelectronic devices. Your cell phone screens pretty much all have ITO. Um, and so, uh, yeah, very important. However, these materials are stoichiometrically complex and therefore challenging to deposit. Um, the typical approach to depositing these materials is via a process known as magnetron sputtering, uh, whereby you take uh, some gas particles such as argon and you energize them into a plasma. That plasma is then made to strike your target, uh, which would be your, your puck of ITO in this case. Uh, and then that striking plasma causes uh, atoms to be ejected from your puck and then deposited onto your substrate. Um, unlike evaporative techniques, this doesn't rely on vapor pressure at all. And so you can have a high degree of fidelity in stoichiometry between your sputtered film and your substrate target. Um, however, uh, unfortunately, this process is also quite aggressive. Uh, Plasmas are harsh environments, as probably comes to no surprise. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the culprits would be energetic atoms, molecules, ions, electrons, UV photons. In the case of TCOs, reduced oxygen is particularly harmful. Uh, and the kinetic energies of the particles in these plasmas is uh, two to three orders of magnitude higher than what you see in evaporative techniques. Hundreds of electrons volts versus less than one electron volt. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this results in very significant damage, potentially, to your, uh, to your substrate, especially if, you're, if you have some exposed sensitive material. Uh, and so in, uh, in the tandem cell literature, the most typical approach to mitigating this damage is with the, excuse me, with the inclusion of a thin uh, but dense hard metal oxide that is deposited by uh, atomic layer deposition. As the name implies, you are depositing this one monolayer at a time, uh, which makes it quite slow. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some uh, efforts uh, in the literature to try and scale up this process, uh, sort of in line. Um, and some of it is promising, but I think generally people still consider ALD to not uh, be uh, up to snuff for uh, high throughput inline manufacturing. Um, and so uh, this brings us to, uh, to our approach. Um, so rather than having this buffer layer to protect your perovskite, what if we don't need any buffer layer at all? Um, and so we wind up sputtering our TCO directly on freestanding polymer films. And so the polymer, in this case, winds up functioning as something of a sacrificial layer. Uh, you know, it will be subject to some amount of damage, uh, but none of the rest of your device will be. You create this bilayer, uh, which you can see in this SEM here. We have our TCO, ITO in this case, and then our polymer here. Uh, it's delaminating because, you know, it's a torn section of film. Um, but you can, uh, you can uh, pattern uh, these, these films, as shown here. Uh, that's our little ITO electrode on a freestanding film. Uh, and then if you want, you can also uh, strip away the polymer by a, by a variety of techniques. So it's very faint, but there's this line right here. Everything above it, it has conjugated polymer. It's a bilayer. And then everything below it is just ITO. And this film was just dipped in chloroform very gently and then pulled back out. Um, and so some key questions that we want to ask is, how is the transparency and conductivity of the TCO affected, if at all? And how difficult is the transfer? Um, now, with the help of, uh, of Ben and Jaden, uh, we did some film characterization, uh, starting with uh, absorbance spectroscopy. Uh, we prepared either uh, ITO, sputtered directly on glass, uh, freestanding P3HPT, uh, 
ITO P3HPT bilayer or uh, just freestanding ITO with the polymer having, having, been, having been stripped either by uh, chloroform uh, dipping or by just air plasma etching. Um, and so there's a variety of features here, uh, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna focus on the blue here, which is the ITO on glass, and then the, the stripped, uh, the stripped uh, scans, which are these two. And as you can see, there's these little features here, these, uh, these small peaks, which still correspond to the polymer peaks. So there's some residual polymer remaining, even after etching. Um, and uh, etching slash stripping. Uh, and then additionally, there's an apparent increase in absorption across the entire spectrum. Uh, now, we're not sure that that is real absorption. Um, to the, the UV Viz, the instrument that we were using for these measurements, uh, the way that the measurements are performed is that you're just measuring the amount of light that is transmitted through, right? So the instrument has no way of actually differentiating between light that was truly absorbed and light that was just reflected. And by etching away the polymer, um, you are uh, increasing the optical impedance at the backside, and therefore you're going to be increasing the reflectance of these freestanding films. And just qualitatively spe speaking, looking at these freestanding uh, you know, etched ITO films, they, they are very shiny, much shinier than ITO on glass. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's about all I want to say about those uh, UV vis scans. Um, but then also we wanted to look at uh, the electrical properties and just, we did some quick measurements, uh, four point probe uh, sheet resistance measurements, and we found something quite interesting. Um, so we had three conditions which was ITO sputtered on glass, uh, pre-stamping P3HPT on the glass and then sputtering on that, or uh, sputtering on freestanding P3HPT and then transferring that by layer onto glass and then measuring. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the sheet resistance, I, I should say all of these samples were prepared in the exact same run uh, of, of ITO. They're, they're, they were in the same chamber simultaneously. Um, and as you can see, there's a very significant drop in sheet resistance uh, for the case where you have uh, sputtered the ITO on the freestanding P3HPT. And uh, we need to do additional structural characterization to verify if this hypothesis is true, but what we think is happening uh, is essentially that the, um, the sputtering, uh, or I should say, backing up a little, Sputtering is known to lead to residual embedded uh, stresses at interfaces. And there's a variety of reasons for why this happens, but part of it is due to the fact that there's local heating happening at the interface uh, as you're depositing. And then your two materials will typically have uh, different coefficients of thermal expansion. And so as your material cools, um, there's uh, strain that is suddenly induced at that interface due to that uh, thermal expansion mismatch. Uh, and that strain can potentially lead to all sorts of defects, such as dislocations, which are exceptionally effective at trapping charge in semiconductors. Um, and so uh, what we think th is that because we're sputtering on just freestanding P3HPT, this is a much more compliant substrate than rigid glass. And so it's able to accommodate that strain much more effectively and therefore lead to, at, at the very least, reduced formation of dislocations uh, in, in uh, that film. And so, you know, like I said, there needs to be some additional characterization, but uh, that's what we think is going on. And uh, lastly, this brings us to uh, our attempt uh, our current attempt, and there's work left to be done, but our current attempt at uh, incorporating these films into some perovskite solar cells. And so um, we built up uh, some, some almost completed uh, half cells with the help of uh, Dennis Cochran, and uh, uh, additional film preparation was done with the help of Jaden and Ben. Um, and um, essentially, we prepared uh, these perovskite cells, uh, finishing uh, off by... Uh, spin coating uh, this uh, electron transporting polymer to DPP to CNTVT, um, and then we prepared bilayers of ITO and that same polymer, or uh, we evaporated uh, silver directly on the spin coated polymer. And so we either uh, yeah we either evaporated or we transferred. Uh, and uh, in the case where we transferred, what we think was happening is depicted by this image here. Um, 
in these JV curves, uh, you can see the silver and blue, and then uh, the freshly transferred devices uh, in orange here. And now that is a flat line, isn't it? Um, it, it, it it's not good. And so, <laughs> however, you might say like, hey, you just messed up your measurement, you have an open circuit. But that's not true. Uh, if we look at the VOC here, the, the bilayer, the, the fresh transfer, has photovoltages that are comparable to that of our controls. And so basically what that's telling us is that the energetics at the interfaces are working out okay. It's just that th there's some other thing that is impeding uh, complete charge extraction. And uh, we believe that it's due to the roughness of the perovskite surface. Um, which are, are just known to be quite rough, potentially in, on the order of 50 nanometers uh, RMS roughness. Uh, and, um, and so we went ahead and uh, heat pressed our, those same devices uh, under 2 megapascals, uh, 150 C for 15 minutes in air. And uh, well, the resulting devices still are not performing as well as our controls, but see a significant improvement in charge extraction in our short circuit uh, uh, current. And uh, well, they're actually producing power now. Uh, and so, you know, there's optimization left to be done. It would be really nice if we're not performing this pressing in air. Uh, we're going to be trying to uh, get some uh, chemical polishing agents and just generally try and improve the smoothness of our perovskite films. Um, and uh, we think that after you know, these optimizations, we'll be able to at least get these bilayer films to be comparable to our controls. Um, but this is the, the current state of things. Um, and so in conclusion, um, uh, we have talked about semiconducting materials and how they form the backbone of photovoltaics and other optoelectronic technologies. Uh, we talked about how, these, uh, how new materials are positioned to play critical roles in these technologies. Uh, but are held back by conventional processing methods. And uh, we talked about how solid phase processing can address the pitfalls, uh, or at least some of the pitfalls, of conventional approaches, as well as open up entirely new processing routes uh, than what has been previously uh, considered, been considered possible. Um, so with that said, thank you for your attention. Uh, this, this is my acknowledgement slide. Darren, David, Thank you both so much. You have been immensely helpful throughout the course of my PhD. And uh, yeah, a special, special thank you to Darren for yanking me uh, into your group. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the rest of my committee. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, the entirety of the Lapomi group. You're, you guys are awesome. I can't imagine a better group to have spent my PhD in. Uh, and, uh, you know, Fenning Group has also been uh, quite invaluable. Thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, various other mentors. Um, and, uh, of course, my family. Uh, mom, dad, brother, Taylor. Where's Taylor? There's Taylor. Uh, <laughs> Taylor's parents, my cat. Thank you, Igloo. <laughs> and uh, some, some key friends. So with that said, uh, yeah, thank you all very much.